Thank you so much, Yeting and Ore. Uh, just hearing you read, both in Mandarin and in English, reminds me so much of the church I just came from in Pasadena, California. We had people from over 70 first language groups in my church, and we would often have scripture read in a variety of languages. I think it gets us ready uh, for heaven. Well, today, as I've thought about my chapel message to you, uh, I feel like I'm going to be speaking to you more as a pastor than perhaps as an institutional chaplain, because I really want us to think about the kind of community that I believe God calls us to be here at uh, Wheaton College. Now, I want you to know, I know that we're not a church. We're a college, and we're a good one. I mean, we have been established to provide excellent, accredited education for a whole variety of fields and areas of study, the majors that you are in. And yet, in spite of that, I also have to say, we're also an educational institution whose curriculum is called Christ at the Core. And we are a college that just enthusiastically says that our education is not just for the formation of your mind, it is for that, but, but our longing is for the growth and formation of your entire life, your whole being. We are learning within this place as, as our framework communicates uh, to do life with God together until each one of us becomes more and more conformed to the image of Christ. So Wheaton College, we are unashamedly a Christ-centered, spirit-indwelt, spirit-guided educational community. Now, what I've been thinking about is, what, what should a community like that be like? And, and for the answer to that this semester, I want us to go back to the very first communities that were like that, who had the Holy Spirit in each one who came to faith in Jesus. And as you know, that takes us back to the book of Acts. Uh, last, Friday, uh, last Wednesday, <laughs> President Reichen started with chapter one, which took us back to the time after Jesus had uh, lived the life we should live, but none of us has perfectly but then been willing to die the death that we deserve, but we don't have to because he did in our place, then defeated sin and death by his resurrection, and then ascended to heaven, Acts chapter 1. And today we come to Acts chapter 2, uh, the time in which, as Jesus had already prophesied would happen, the Holy Spirit would come and fall upon and come within each person who followed Jesus by faith. Uh, the kind of communities that began to be formed after that is what the book of Acts is all about, at least the very beginnings of them, in what is called the Acts of the Apostles, or last week, if you listened to President Riken's message, the Acts of the Apostles, he said, perhaps we should retitle it something like this. Listen to what he said. It's, it's the story of Jesus Christ through the acts of ordinary Christians like us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm, I think it's a great title. It might be a tad bit long, but just think about it again. What we're going to be looking at this semester in our Monday chapels is the story of Jesus Christ through the acts of ordinary Christians like us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So in our Monday chapels, we're going to be looking at what happened in those communities when the Holy Spirit came and lived within them, as found in the book of Acts. And then on Fridays, because we're going to be thinking about the acts of God's Spirit through ordinary Christians like us, we're going to be having some of the stories of people right here in our Wheaton community about what God is doing in them and through them and among us as Christians. So today, uh, I'm going to take us back to those very first Christ-centered, Spirit-filled communities and on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. Now, before we go there, I do have to say something about the story before the story, because you really can't understand what happened when the Holy Spirit came and people understood all these different languages as if they were speaking their own, unless you understand what happened in Genesis 11 when we have the incident of the Tower of Babel. If you don't know it, go back and, and read that. When you read the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, when sin entered the world, 
then what happened is human relationships became characterized by brokenness. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, uh, the first two people, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God, and the relationship with God was characterized by brokenness, but not just that. It affected every other relationship that we have to people and to the world that we are in. Uh, the marriage relationship of Adam and Eve was characterized by brokenness. I mean, they started blaming one another for everything that was going wrong. And family relationships began to be broken because they had two other children, uh, Cain and Abel. Well, Cain killed Abel. That's a broken family, wouldn't you say? You also find out that there were some other, other tribal communities, and those relationships were broken from one another as well. So in the earliest time, you begin to see the brokenness that happens among people. But something does change in Genesis chapter 11. And that's where people who are usually at, in, at enmity with one another started to come together with a shared purpose. Now, that in and of itself sounds pretty good, unless the purpose itself is not good, and it wasn't. The idea there was people thought they would come together and actually become like God and take over and build this tower that would make them people who wouldn't need God at all. They, they would be self-sufficient. But the Bible says God said no and confused the people's languages. Because of that, they couldn't understand one another and they were dispersed geographically. But the point I want to make is that it was never God's intent that people, I mean all human beings made in the image of God, would remain divided. That human beings would remain at enmity with one another due to all sorts of reasons. There in Genesis 11, it was language, but I'll tell you, we experience many other reasons why we human beings are broken, don't we? Not just language, but race, yeah. politics. Have you lived the past year here in the U.S.? Uh, gender issues separate us. Age, generational issues separate us. I experienced all of that as a pastor. God's intent was not to leave us broken, but to do something that would be able to build at the end one eternal family, people knit together who would live in love and unity in the midst of what has been a broken family and thereby glorify his name, reflect what God is like. Three, but always one, diverse in this new family, but one in Christ. So what we see in our text today is people gathering with all these different languages as their first language. But the Spirit of God is going to begin to reverse the effects of what happened at Babel. The Spirit of God is going to come into these new communities where people believe in Jesus and receive the Spirit of God within them to undo the effects of human sin. So when you read Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost, you need to see that what God is doing is reversing the effects of Babel and beginning to bring people back together again. So you heard the story. Uh, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, uh, these apostles who were Galilean and Galileans were renowned. They have very strong accents. I guess if they were in the U.S., it would be kind of like, I don't know, Texans or New Yorkers or maybe my heritage, which is West Virginia. And yet what happened, the Holy Spirit came upon them as they were back in, in a room. The Spirit empowered them so that they would go out and begin speaking. And people who had gathered at Pentecost, who had come from almost every people group, language group in the entire world, heard them. And though they were Galileans with those strong accents, the people heard those people speaking in their own language. It's an amazing thing that happened. I try to imagine it. Uh, people from all over the world now hearing the message, but in their heart language. See what's happening. It was the undoing of, it was the reversing of the effects of sin at Babel. Now, I'll just say this right now. This is what should happen in any community where Jesus is the Lord. All the awful effects of sin in our world that, that divide us from God and from one another should begin to be seen to be reversing because of the work of God among us. Something that the Apostle Paul wrote often about, and especially the book of Ephesians is about this. Uh, the Jew and Gentile had come to Jesus, many of them, and yet they didn't want to be in one community together. And the Apostle Paul says, get over it. This is a part of God's eternal plan. Listen to what he has to say in Ephesians chapter 1. 
God chose us in Christ, and he did it before the creation of the world. Why? Purposing, he said, in Christ, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. So when you come to Pentecost, that's what you begin to see happening in the book of Acts, chapter 2. God is beginning his work to bring together one family that is knit together through faith in the Lord Jesus and the shared experience of the presence of God through his Holy Spirit living within us. All right, then back again to me thinking kind of as a pastor. That's the kind of community we profess to be here at Wheaton College. What should that kind of community look like? And we're going to be seeing it all through the semester. I hope you will tune into the chapter, uh, chapels as we think about this. But let me just say a few things. Number one, it's clear that a community like this should be a very diverse community. Diverse as the kingdom of God is diverse. Or I might put it this way, a, a community of God's everyone's. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, we read that all these people who had come from so many places heard, each in their own language, what did they hear? Verse 11 says, they heard the mighty saving works of God. Then the apostle Peter got up and preached what must have been a powerful sermon in which he proclaimed in verse 21, so that everyone, everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, here's my question for us. Who's in that God's everyone? Who's in God's everyone who will be in this eternal family? And what we're going to be seeing in the book of Acts is that back then, as now, there were clearly many people in God's list of everyones that many of the people didn't want to have in their everyones. Uh, let me just walk you through the story of the book of Acts, and you'll see the kinds of people that God brings into the family and to whom he gives his Holy Spirit. So you have Acts chapter 2, what we read today. You had on one side Aramaic or Hebrew-speaking Jewish people gathered at Pentecost, but you also had people who spoke other languages, mostly Greek-speaking Jewish people. Now, you need to know those two groups didn't generally get along very well. The, the Greek speakers, other language speakers, were often viewed as the liberals because they had hung around with so many people from around the world, and, and the Aramaic Hebrew-speaking people were often viewed as sort of like the fundies, the ones who didn't want anything to change. And yet, here we say, see God saying, no, both through faith in Christ are people that I accept and I'm going to give my spirit to. Well, they're at least all Jewish. But then you come to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, and the message of Jesus comes to the Samaritans who were always at odds with the Jewish people. Uh, many of them had Jewish blood pumping through their veins, but they were viewed from the doctrines that they held to as, as heretical, but they believed in Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues as well. And it's obvious God is saying, through faith in Jesus, therein too, I have accepted them. You read on in Acts chapter 8, and we come to an Ethiopian eunuch who was there. I mean, Ethiopian eunuch. You need to know that the racial, cultural, socioeconomic, political, and certainly sexual barriers that this one man, this Ethiopian eunuch, presented for being a part of the family of God, those were enormous barriers that had to be overcome. Now, I'm not going to be talking much about that, but in this semester, Dr. Esau McCauley is going to be speaking about that. I think you're going to want to tune in. Uh, and he is entitling his message he wrote me, and he, and he said, I want it to be called, Who's in God's Family? It's an important message. So maybe that's it, just Samaritan and Jews. No, no, come to chapter 10, and you can almost feel the people who had come to Jesus and were in the church are saying, oh, no, not them. Because in Acts chapter 10, we have Gentiles, like most of us are, coming into the family of God, 
where there was a huge wall between Jew and Gentile in the first century. How can we believe that they are in too through faith in Jesus? Because God says so. Through faith, they not only came to know salvation, but received the Spirit of God and spoke in tongues just like the Jews in Acts 2, just like the Samaritans in Acts 8. And Acts goes on and on and on with this, telling us who is in this family of God's everyone's until you come to a place like uh, Acts chapter 19 and you have this strange small group of people who were still uh, followers of John the Baptist. Are they in too? Well, they believed and received the Holy Spirit too. All this is to say, all this is to say, and I want you to hear me here, that the reach of God's grace and the reach of God's mercy to bring people in to his family to forgive their pasts and remake their futures extends far beyond what most human beings can even imagine. Many of those that we're going to be seeing welcomed into the family of God in the book of Acts were people that those who had been in the people of God before would have found very challenging to have welcomed. I can imagine when Gentiles were in, many of those who had already been in the church, especially the Jewish people, would have said, oh no, how am I even going to tell my family that I'm in a community like this? It was even hard for people like the Apostle Peter. He had to have a dream. Uh, and, and the powerful message of God to him in the midst of that dream is, Peter, don't declare unclean what I say, God said. What I say is clean. In Acts 15, they even had to have a conference in Jerusalem because it becomes pretty obvious that many of the Jewish people didn't want these Gentiles, not in their local churches. And yet what you see, if you read through Acts chapter 15, essentially is the scripture said this would happen. They went back to the Bible as we always should. Not only that, but they have received the Holy Spirit just like we have. So God has already said yes. And ultimately, deep down, not one of us deserves to be in the family of our holy God, for we have fallen short too. God's everyone's made up of everyone who confesses our sins and responds to Jesus in faith. We received the Holy Spirit. We should have already seen this. Last semester here at Wheaton, we went through the Gospel of Luke. We see the ones that Jesus entered into their lives, and it's just amazing when you, you think about it. People like a prostitute in Luke chapter 7, was pronounced as having the shalom of peace of God. Tax collectors, a Roman military man, people demonized that Jesus met them, entered into their lives with respect, and brought them the blessings of the kingdom. Now, as we read through Acts, we're going to read the same kinds of people coming of it, now becoming a part of the household of faith. So that's the first thing I pray for us, that increasingly we will become a community as, as broad and diverse as God's everyone's, as our eternal family of God. Now, not only that, but also not just a diverse community, but a humble community. Because what we are, if I'll put it this way, we are a community of God's everyone's in which everyone needs to be changed. Each one of us is not yet all that God would have us to be. Sometimes people get the idea, we want to go back and be like the church in the first century because they were perfect. Anybody who says that to me, I said, all you have to do is read the book of Acts, and you're going to see that they have the very same kinds of failures and divisions and conflicts that we do now, where we need to fall upon the Spirit of God to help us to experience the reconciling power of the Spirit, to dispel the myth of the perfection of the early church. I simply say, read the book of Acts. And what are you going to see? You're going to see that they wrestled with dishonesty and deceit, Read Acts chapter 5, it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira who sold property, but they wanted to give it to the church, but they wanted the people to think that they were better than they really were, more perfect than they really were. Does that still exist in our communities? Acts chapter 6, there were people within the community, but because they weren't as valued as others, often their needs weren't even seen. So that the leaders were the apostles, all Jewish men, but now that they had all these Greek-speaking folks in, some of their widows were there and hurting, but nobody even saw them. And it took a major change for them to be able to become the kind of welcoming community 
that the kingdom of God demands of us. You, you read, were they perfect? You read about a former sorcerer named Simon who had come to Jesus and been baptized, but he still wanted prestige and power, and that had to be changed on him. Does that still exist in our Christian communities? And of course, as I mentioned, Acts chapter 15, we had some people who didn't want those Gentiles in. And that is followed up by what, by, what, by what might be the most difficult thing for many people of all, and that is two of their major spiritual leaders got into a big time conflict. And there I'm talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul, and Barnabas. Chapter 15, verse 39, the Bible simply tells us they had a sharp disagreement. I'll tell you that language is too weak for what the original language actually says. A sharp disagreement that led them for a season to be separated. All that is to say that what happens when we receive Jesus by faith is we're declared right with God, called justification. We are given his Holy Spirit and put into a Christian community, but a community where all of us must grow to become what God would have us to be. And it's to happen by the work of the Holy Spirit within that community. How does that play out at a place like Wheaton College? Well, as simply as, I, as I've thought about it, I think, well, we begin by hiring people who name Jesus as their Savior and Lord. We continue by enrolling students who profess faith in Jesus. And then here, what we do is we have our education based upon the essentials of the gospel that we have put in our statement of faith. We want what we teach and how we live to be consistent with that statement of faith. Then we do life together. We, we do life at the college, doing what we call life with God. And I want to call it life with God together, all making a commitment now to grow toward becoming what the book of Romans calls conformed to the image of Jesus himself. And we've tried to express what that might look like through our community covenant. We're not saying that everyone immediately when you step in there has to be absolutely perfect. But we enter into this journey of sanctification, of growth together toward being able to live out those commitments that we make to one another and to the college. And third, then knowing that we're all on a journey still as a humble community, knowing how much we need the transforming work of Christ in our lives, we engage in many of the spiritual disciplines that are a part of our growth. We worship together, what chapel is about. Prayerfully, you'll be able to find a small group where you can pray for one another and correct one another and encourage one another and walk with one another until you become the beautiful language, complete in Christ, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, Ephesians chapter three. And by God's grace, we don't give up on ourselves or in others. We hold people accountable and sometimes a separation must, may come, but we know that the grace of God is sufficient that when we turn to him, he will receive us and begin again. Now within a Christian community, you know, if you've ever been in any church or any other Christ-centered community, we often fail in that becoming all that God would have us to be. And there are two main enemies, I think, to that. I was talking, the church I pastored was Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena, California. We had a wonderful counseling center. I was talking with one of the women who was involved in doing some of that counseling, and she said she is finding in our day there are two main enemies to people actually being able to grow in their faith to become more and more like Christ. One is hiding stuff, hiding. Sometimes we feel like we have to because we think if people found out what I've done in my life or the temptations that I still have, they'll just reject me and leave me out. That will make it impossible to be able to grow. Uh, so in many ways, if we have to hide things that are true about ourselves, we'll almost never be able to bring those and find victory over them. When people sinned in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve hid, even though God had made the things they tried to hide in. And the same thing she said is true now. We have to have communities where they are grace-filled. When we open up those parts that are true in our lives, that people will hold us accountable for them to be different, but at the same time will not write us off 
as having no hope. But the other thing she said, it's not just hiding, it's also not humbly acknowledging that we still have to grow, pretending that it's everybody else in the community or everybody else in the world that needs to change and grow. And she said what she has seen in her counseling practice has been the people who come in only want affirmation of what they're doing and who they are and not transformation. She said that may be the most lethal things to our spiritual growth imaginable. We do need the affirmation of God's family. I see the image of God in you. But we also need a call for all of us to commit ourselves to transformation, to denying ourselves, taking up a cross and following Jesus, whatever he asks of us. So I'm praying that that's the kind of community we will be. So a diverse community, like the kingdom of God, a humble community that knows all of us, each of us, needs to be transformed by Christ. And then briefly, finally, a confident community that we don't give up simply because we have failed. We have a lot of perfectionists here at Wheaton College, and yet we are not yet made perfect. So we can have confidence, even as we're on this journey, because we know how things will end. God gives his spirit to us and promises that what he does, he will not quit until he has completed that work. So we are a part of a community made up of people of every tribe, language, and nation. A community not only that diverse, but that when God is done, each one of us will be conformed to the image of Christ. Where does that work happen? It happens in grace-filled communities where the Spirit of God reigns and here we pray for one another and help one another and hold one another accountable. And that is what I pray Wheaton College will be more and more for you. I, I pray we'll be an academic community where here in this college you will get the very best education imaginable preparing you for your future. But I tell you, I'm also praying that will be a life-changing community in which you become what God created you to be, complete in Christ. So I'll end by just Christianizing <laughs> a song by John Lennon of the Beatles. I'll put it this way. In the end, God will make all things right. If things aren't right, it's not the end. But all things will be right. Our world and the kingdom of justice and peace, our own Wheaton College community, and you and me too. And it will be to your joy. And it will be to God's glory. Amen. I want to send you with this Christ-centered benediction. So now, may our dying Savior's love for you, may our risen Savior's power to change you, may our ascended Savior's prayer daily on your behalf, and may our returning Savior's glory be so real to you that it guides you and sustains you, both this week and forevermore. Amen. Now go in his peace.